Okay, so we're going to take a little break from projects for a little bit. So make sure that you get your all of your um, planning documents and all of your uh, design documents from your, your slow car are turned in. I need those for grading. And now we are going to do a little bit more work on the book. Our very last chapter from the book, actually, is chapter 6. Let's take a look at that. I'm going to just rearrange a little bit here just so we're kind of where we should be. We're going to work on chapter 6 this week. Um, and then next week, at the beginning of November, we'll start some new projects. And uh, let's take a look at some of the projects that we might do here. So some of the projects that we've uh, we've got coming still, um, one of them has to do with um, doing some hydraulics, and that will probably be our last project with the with the building kit that I gave you. Maybe the last two projects. We've got a couple of different ones. They've got one that they call the hydraulic arm that looks kind of like this, and then. <coughs> So this is a hydraulic arm is essentially something that you can build to scoop up um, something, to grab something. And then they have an advanced hydraulic arm, which is this one here. One of them, the first one uses three hydraulic, uh, three different hydraulics, and this one, the advanced one, uses four different hydraulics. So we may end up doing both of those. Those are kind of fun. One of them, the, the second one is essentially the so essentially a, uh, a modification of the first one, I suppose, you can think of it as. Um, but they're both fun because you get to use, um, you get to use these hydraulic controls with the cylinders and uh, pistons. There's some other ones, so there's, there's a closer look at the advanced hydraulic arm. This one rotates back and forth 
it goes up and moves up and down, it can move forward and it has this grasping arm out in front. And obviously the design that, that they're, you're seeing here, we couldn't do because they use so many different plastic parts. And I haven't given you that many plastic parts. But you can build a similar design. And I don't want you to build their design exactly, I want you to build your own design. So. Um, That is the idea there. Here's a, uh, no, another version of this more advanced kind of arm where you have rotation and lift and movement. There's lots of different versions of this. And uh, you'll make your own version, make your own design, and build it, and test it, and modify it, and rebuild it, and so on. So those are good projects. Those are good final projects that are a little more advanced obviously. Another one is this uh, ping pong ball launcher. I don't think I gave you guys a ping pong ball, but they're easy enough to find. But there are lots of different ways to, to launch a ping pong ball using these, uh, these parts. And uh, that's another one we may do where we do ping pong ball launching for distance and for accuracy. And This is one I can't remember if we have the parts for this one. I don't think we do have the parts for this one. This one involves a different, some different parts, some different kits that we don't have. So we won't do that one. The bug one is more of an electronics lab. So anyway, um, those are projects that we may, that we may do here as we come up into November. Right now we're obviously at the end of October, November coming up soon. But then when we come back from Thanksgiving, we'll be done with those projects and we will do some SketchUp um, computer drafting design and the 3D printer prototyping. So you get to use the 3D printer at the end of this class, which students kind of like. So um, that's what we got coming, coming up. After we're done with chapter six this week, we will have to have an exam. We haven't had a true exam yet this semester. And so we'll have a midterm that will cover essentially the materials that we've studied in the book so far, which are chapters one, two, three, five, and six. Everything except chapter four. So after we're done with chapter six, we'll have a midterm that covers the stuff in the uh, the stuff from the book, essentially. And then, at the end of the year, we won't have a traditional final exam. We will have a um, presentation that you will give on your final project, which is the SketchUp and 3D printing prototyping um, project, the design project at the end. And that will be your final exam, essentially, is your presentation of that project. So. That's where we're at here. Um, let's go ahead and start with chapter six. Today we're going to be um, learning about engineering communications. We're going to learn uh, how to research. We're going to learn how to give oral presentations. We're going to learn how to do written presentations. We're going to learn how to make graphs. We're going to learn how to use uh, imagery. We're going to learn how to write. Um, different things. Um, we're not going to go into great detail. It's not going to be like an English class all stuffed into a single week. Um, but we will kind of talk about the basics. Um, when an engineer communicates, they really need to be very clear, and very concise, and straightforward so that people understand what they're trying to get across. Because engineers are often explaining very complex uh, everything. Complex systems, complex ideas, everything. So um, your homework for chapter six, I want you to do number one and number two here on page 171, 172. But number one has uh, 20, 35 parts or something to it. And number two has A through Q, parts A through Q. And they're the only two problems in that whole section. There's only two problems in this chapter. But they're not terribly difficult. Number one um, 
you're editing sentences to improve the grammar and style of the sentences. <clears throat> and to do that, you kind of need to either remember some of the things you learned in English or go through a lot of the stuff that is in section 6.3, the writing section, which is the last section of the chapter. 6.3 goes through a lot of different things like verb, noun, agreement with, uh, you know, conjugating your verbs properly, say I walk instead of I walks, things like that. Um, punctuation, using punctuation properly, they talk about using words properly, um, lots of different things that they go through here uh, to make sure that you're writing clean sentences that make sense, that are clear, and that are simple which is really what we want in engineering education. So, and that's number one. Number two in the homework is, um, in number two, you're going to reduce the number of words used in a sentence. So you have these really long sentences and you're supposed to write them in a shorter way, but using, but having all the same information, so you don't want to lose any information, but you want to rewrite the sentence using fewer, clearer words. And again, that's from 6.3 in the last part of the chapter. We'll get to that stuff probably around Friday. But today we're going to talk a little bit about section 6.1, which is preparation for communication. No matter what kind of communication you're doing, no matter what you're doing, writing or oral presentation or anything else, your preparation is essentially the same, no matter what you're doing. You need to research, you need to figure out who you're gonna to talk to and how you're gonna to talk to them. And you need to have some kind of outline to go on, to, to work from. Um, you're gonna, that means you're gonna end up doing a lot of studying, you're gonna be looking at things online, you're gonna be reading things, and you're also going to maybe be reading some people, figuring out who it is that you're going to be talking to, um, what kind of education they have maybe, what kind of background they're coming from, from the business world, from the science world, whatever. And so you have a lot of work to do prep, um, to prepare to communicate. Sometimes you don't have the time to communicate. Sometimes you don't know that you're going to have to communicate. And that's why engineers and other people who communicate regularly do this all the time. They're always studying, they're always learning, and they're always prepared to communicate. Uh, so, let's learn about this a little bit. Where can we study, or where can we learn, uh, or research the things that we need to know about engineering? I'm just gonna type in engineering research and see what comes up. So, we have Wikipedia, of course, will be almost the first thing up on any search you put on, on Google. And that's fine. We can go ahead and hit that and see if it gives us any relevant information. Why not? So here they're going to give us some engineering schools, engineering degree, engineering education research, engineering things to work on. Um, and that's all they've really given us. They haven't told us much else. They've just given us some other things to look at. That's fine. Let's look here. ERC program. Engineering Research Centers by the National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation is the government's organization for supporting science. They give a lot of money out to scientists and engineers to do research, to do education, to do all kinds of things. Um, I've participated in National Science Foundation in grants and programs and everything else. I've actually worked for the National Science Foundation uh, reviewing other people's grants to see if uh, their proposals were worthy of giving money to. And um, if you are ever in the engineering field, the science field, education field, and in the sciences or, or engineering, you will probably um, interact with the NSF at some point, in some way. It's, it's, it's a, just a very pervasive organization. They're everywhere out there. 
Um, the ERC program, what is it? <laughs> the Engineering Research Centers are interdisciplinary, multi-institutional centers that join academic industry and government to produce transformational engineering systems along with engineering graduates for adept innovation, prime for leadership of the global community. So apparently these things are all over the place, and they're designed to help engineers do more engineering and do better engineering, right? They're going to have meetings, obviously. They're going to have some people that are in charge of things. They're going to have a leadership uh, organization of some kind. But let's see what kind of resources they might have. Let's take a look at their locations, for example. So it looks like there are two of them in Colorado. Those are probably the two closest to us. They're right there in the Denver area. Probably they're in Boulder. Um, no, looks like, uh, let's see here. Yep, they're both they're actually near the Denver area. So they have the ERC for Extreme Ultraviolet Science and Technology, up to Electric Computing Systems Center. And uh, they're both in Colorado. So if you were interested in doing uh, ultraviolet or optic or optoelectronic systems, you'd go do some research there. Is this the kind of research that we're going to do for engineering in this class? Probably not. We're probably not going to do optoelectronic or extreme ultraviolet. Um, looks like another close one would be Iowa. Iowa has the bio biorenewable chemicals. Oh, that's something that's maybe a little more down our alley, something that we might get interested in here in Nebraska. Biorenewable renewable chemicals are something that most of the Midwestern states have some kind of interest in. Let's look at some other ones that, might, that we might be interested in if we were doing a, some kind of uh, project. University of Washington has one in biomaterials engineering. Um, advanced combustion, that might be interesting because we do ethanol in Nebraska, right? I just happen to know that at Brigham Young University and University of Utah, I went to Brigham Young University, their advanced combustion actually has to do with rockets, but that's okay. Um, synthetic biology, there's another one that we might be interested in, synthetic fuels being an interest in, nor in uh, in Nebraska. Um, reinventing America's urban water infrastructure. Probably not, right? Because we're not urban. There's nothing urban in, in all of Nebraska. Not even Omaha is really all that urban because it's just a single city. Um, let's see what else we got here. Biomimetic. No, probably not us. Neuromorphic, probably not us. Um, Biorenewable chemicals again. Oh, that's the Iowa one that we saw. Um, bioengineering, Tennessee. That's probably something that we might be interested in here. We do a lot of that kind of stuff. Renewable electric electrical energy delivery and management. Um, power electrical systems. We might be interested in here. Let's see here, health in the environment. Everybody's interested in health. We can get involved in that. Organic particulate systems, we can get involved. Um, large structural systems, maybe we're going to build something big. Biotechnology processes engineering. Uh, so there's some, so uh, obviously there are some places all over the nation where they're building these centers where they're doing research that we might be interested in. And that's fine. That's exactly what we. Um, Pennsylvania has an earthquake engineering research center. That's weird. <laughs> no, that's New York. It's still weird. I think you'd think they'd be in California, but that's okay. <clears throat> so, apparently, the National Science Foundation has centers where they're doing research all over the nation, and they're collaborating with research. And we could maybe go to one of these sites. They're all, each one of these things is going to have a website that we could look up if we're interested in one of these types of engineering. And that's great. Um, let's take a look at let's maybe look at the research highlights. Why not? Let's look at uh, let's look at biotechnology. Let's see what they got here. 
So lots of different things that they're doing here. Stem cells. Let's look at stem cells just for fun. So they're funding a unique research program on stem cell biomanufacturing. And $3 million award comes from NSF's Integrative Graduate Education Research Traineeship. Supports innovation in the graduation, successfully integrating knowledge of stem cell biology with bioprocess engineering. So essentially they're trying to figure out a way to develop or to, to make a process for stem cells. So that's great. Here are all the different uh, things that they're going to do with this. They're going to bring some money into the schools to do this research, and that's good. So this is a good, this is not a bad place to start if you're trying to find some information on engineering, different lots of different engineering fields. Uh, there are other things like this. Um, for example, um, let me think if I can remember the name of it. Uh, it's, I think it's dot, dot org. Yeah, engineering, engineering for change org, I guess. So this one here, um, we can just read what it says up here. It's a forum to connect, collaborate, solve challenges, share knowledge with a growing community of engineers, technologists, social scientists, so on and so forth. And there are other engineering websites like this where you essentially have one website where a lot of people are getting together to share ideas. And that's great. <laughs> There are lots of things like this, and if you find one that you really like, great, use it. However, in most situations, you're going to have something specific that you want to learn about. Um, let's take, for example, designing bridges. We've done that before in this class. Engineering.org, first one that comes up, not a bad place to go. It's curriculum for K through 12 teachers, and they're going to have lots of different resources in here for teachers to use, and they could also be good resources for just learning, for learning about building bridges. Right here, they're talking about dead loads and live loads and environmental loads and everything else, and they give little drawings, and they're going to explain different concepts, forces, compression, tension, I-beams, uh, all kinds of things they're going to talk about here. So you can learn a lot here. And not a bad place to go. But as you get further along in your education, you need to really be looking at si websites and resources that are much more reputable. The ones that have the academic level that you're looking at. As a freshman in college, you want stuff that's kind of freshman level in college. As a sophomore in college, you want a little higher level. Um, as you get towards the end of your college years, you want to use websites that are pure engineering websites for engineers. So your research has to grow with your ability and your education. Your, your resources for your research have to grow and increase. Uh, by the time you're a senior in college designing bridges, you should never look at anything that is not either a university or an engineering company. Okay? But pretty much you should be in the engineering world at full. If you ever use Wikipedia, you probably get fired because you don't know what you're doing. So uh, you really do want to let your your research grow with your education. It should grow. Um, don't go back to the, uh, the online. I'm going to build a bridge on my computer um, for you know for fun as a game. Um, kind of like this one right here. If I that's not the same one. Um,
Right, so let's say that you used one of these bridge designing websites when you were doing a project in your freshman year, and then all of a sudden you're in your senior year and you want to use it again. I wouldn't recommend it, because what is great for a freshman year project is not acceptable in a senior year project. And if you start citing, we build bridges for fun in highschool.com in your senior building project in college, you, you'll be hammered. However, if you go on to something that's a little more, uh, a little more advanced, right? You might do better. I'm not sure if this one's any more advanced. It doesn't, uh, doesn't really show right off. It looks like it probably is not right off all that more advanced. But um, there are websites that are more advanced. University websites are often a really good resource because they're not only doing education, but they're also doing real world research. So you can get kind of the, you can get kind of a, a big mixture of things. For example, here they have the lesson plans and hands-on building project activities, which are gonna be more educational. But these other things may have a little more detail um, because it is an engineering kind of kind of website from Yale University. And then you can go to websites like, um, let's see if I can find a good one here. So here we have, uh, this is a, a government website where they're giving a presentation on designing bridges here, right? They're talking about trucks that are colliding with a bridge. This gives you information and detail that is much more real world, right? And that's something that you might go to when you're getting further along in your engineering process. Steel Bridge Design Handbook. At this point, you're looking at um, a handbook for actual engineers, the National Steel Bridge Alliance. Right? Here, is the, here is the website Autodesk which is the company that makes AutoCAD. And they're gonna have some pretty advanced stuff going on here because AutoCAD is used to design bridges. So you have lots of different resources out there. You can start off pretty simple this early on. You can start off in places like Wikipedia and then go from there to find other resources. But you really should try to find the resources that are the most advanced but you still understand them. The most advanced ones you can find that you still understand enough of to use, to make use of. Do not go to some kind of, some kind of paper on the internet about building bridges where you don't even understand the first word in the, in, in the paper because it can really throw you for a loop. An example of this might be this one right here. <coughs> So here we have a case study, a computer science perspective on bridge design. And here they're talking about all kinds of things, I'm sure, pretty, pretty early on. Um, cable state bridges and other things that we're, we're not gonna really, we're not gonna really understand, I'm guessing. Especially because they're talking about, they're probably gonna talk about computer science right off. So, um, looks like they've got a Gantt chart here. How about that? This one you actually may be able to understand. It looks like it's not as, not as bad as I thought. Not bad. Just wanted to keep for the record. 
but you really do want to spend some time looking for a lot of different resources, finding the ones that can be useful to you, and not going too advanced, but not going too simple either. You want to find the, the, the most advanced material that you can understand completely, and then go ahead and use it. And there are just tons and tons of resources out there. In your book, they give you a lot of things to research. They talk about a lot of things to research that I'm not going to recommend you look for at this early stage of your career. For example, they say they look at technical journals and conference proceedings, patents, government reports. Um, I would not recommend those things this early in your career. Patents um, are not nearly as straightforward as you think they might be. They're not just a picture with arrows pointing to things and explanations. They're extremely, uh, extremely painful documents to deal with. Um, articles that are coming from academics, so um, what they often, what do they call them here? Technical journals. Um, technical journals are essentially like magazines that are put out regularly by professionals in the field. And if you're bridge, building bridges, the civil engineering societies will have uh, uh, these journals that come out probably every few months that speak specifically to specific things about bridges. And they will be too specific for us, too detailed, too advanced for us. So I would not recommend your average technical journal for your average beginning engineering student. Um, every once in a while you might find one that, that works, but it's not likely. Your best bet is to look, look on the internet and compare lots of different sources. Trying to get away from the more juvenile sources, get away from the easy, simple, simplistic stuff with cartoons on it, and try to lean a little bit more towards the stuff that's starting to look more technical, starting to be a little more advanced, and use as much of that as you can. So that is what I have to say about research. Now, while you're researching, while you're learning some, some things about what you're trying to what kind of project you're doing or whatever thing you're doing. It may be a presentation, it may be a paper, maybe a manual you have to write, whatever it is you're researching for. While you're doing this, you should be constantly thinking about organization. How am I going to put this together? It doesn't necessarily mean you need to be organizing, but you should be thinking about it and maybe even taking a few notes here there, write down something, a thought. Um, you should always have something that you're writing on to keep keep track of thoughts and ideas that are coming to your head. Because they will come. As you're researching things, it will automatically be a natural part of your brain's process to think, oh, I could use that at this part of my presentation. Oh, this will go well in this part of the design that I'm doing. Oh, this is a new idea that maybe I'm going to go with for whatever. Um, you should take note of those things. Write them down. Start to organize your research a little bit in that way. Maybe you have different folders you put it in on your computer. Maybe you'll have different folders on your desk you'll put them in. It doesn't really matter how you organize it, but you should start thinking about organizing it. And the number one thing that you need to do is you need to remember what are you communicating and who are you communicating it to? Who is your audience? What am I trying to tell them? What am I trying to get across to them? Sometimes your audience is going to be other engineers. For example, if you're putting together ideas for a project and you're going to present this to the other engineers working on the project, there's your audience, your other engineers. But sometimes you're going to be talking to a customer. For example, I have some engineers tomorrow that we'll be meeting with, somebody who wants some bags for their motorcycle modified so that they work better. They're going to be talking with somebody that is a customer, not an engineer. So you have to approach those things differently. You have to think about them differently. You have to organize the research differently. And you have to actually do the communication differently. So as you're researching and as you're thinking about this organizational thing, you need to take notes, get some order involved. And then you're actually going to order things. So if you look on page 149, 
we actually have several different ways that you could possibly organize. We're going to look at these for a second before we're done today. This will be the last thing we do today. So let's look at these. One, two, three, four, five, six different ways um, to organize information for communicating. They're pretty self-explanatory once you once you read the title, but um, we'll talk about them anyway. The first one is a chronological stra a strategy. Right? Chronological meaning there is logic to the time. So it's going to be in order of time, usually. And what that means is that for a given project or a given presentation or a given whatever that you're doing, a design or something, there is something that involves time. So let's say that I'm presenting a, I'm giving a presentation on bridges throughout history, right? Well, that's obviously a good candidate for the chronological organization because history started at some point a long time ago and it's going forward into the future in the future. And there's the in-between. And the bridges kind of follow that timeline with their complexity and their ingenuity and everything else. So a chronological strategy might be a good idea for something that automatically has some history to it and some future to it. Right? Something that is already kind of timeline based. You can also do something chronological that is not necessarily timeline based. You can make it timeline based, but it's a little more challenging. Um, but it can be done. So, a spatial strategy. A spatial strategy, um, spatial having to do with space or where things are or how they're put together or how they work together, that um, that also applies in a lot of different cases. For example, we go back to our bridges. We're talking about bridges today. Why not talk about bridges? If you're going to a spatial strategy with bridges, and maybe you want to talk about the design of a cable suspension bridge, well, that's when you get out a drawing, a diagram of a cable suspension bridge, and you start labeling the parts, and you start describing where they are and what they do and everything else, and it becomes very much about where things are. But the spatial is very visually dependent. So you have to have good visuals when you're, doing, when you're communicating that way. If you're doing it as a presentation, you'd better have good diagrams, labeled well, not too cluttered, not too simplistic, right? You've got to get the right balance, and you've got to be able to describe them well. You've got to be able to answer questions that come up. Um, when you have those visual things going on. But the chronological strategy, going back one here, it's very important that you keep that chronology in order and that it makes sense in order. Right? If it doesn't, then you'll confuse people. So each one of these strategies has their strengths and you have to play to those strengths. Debate strategy. Pros and cons is what it's all about. There's a good thing, there's some good things, there's some bad things. There's some ups, there's some downs, positive, negatives. And you are going to organize your information that you've done research on into those camps, pros or cons, all right? General to specific strategy, another very common one. This one happens when you're building a bridge, but there's one specific thing on the bridge that you're changing in the design. There's one thing that you're focusing on. So you start off with a diagram of the entire bridge and you explain how this bridge holds up its weight in general, just in very, in very general and very simple terms. And then as you focus in on the one little thing, maybe it's just a cable connection somewhere, that you're going to give your presentation on, your information gets more and more detailed, more and more complex, and you really focus on that one little place that general to specific strategy. Problem to solution strategy. This is a very common one for engineers where you start off with a problem. What is our problem? 
We need to get across this water, right? What is the solution? Well, a bridge is not the only solution. Maybe you suggest several solutions and then you do some kind of analysis that shows that the bridge is the best solution. They actually tried that. I, I mean, they've, they've done this in several places in the world and decided not to build bridges. There are tunnels that go under, underneath water. In many places in the world, the most famous probably being the channel or the English channel. The channel channel, the channel channel, whatever. Right? So um, the problem to solution, you present the problem, you describe all the different, the different variables going on with this problem, and then you present a solution or multiple solutions that take care of these problems, analyze them. Uh, maybe, you, uh, maybe one of these solutions is your favorite because of its uh, many pros, few cons, or whatever. And then you argue for these things. You argue for the best solution um, in your presentation, in your paper, in your uh, email, whatever. I'm actually in the process of doing this right now myself. Um, I'm in a group of, of teachers at the college that where we're choosing a project to do at the college. And um, there are some people that believe that one project is the best project. And I am in another group that believes that a different project is the better project. We're looking for a project that will benefit the school and uh, as a whole. And my opinions are different than other people's opinions. So right now on my desk, on my computer, I am writing a problem to solution strategy that's combined a little bit with a uh, little pros and cons as well. I'm combining those two strategies to develop my argument for why I think this particular solution is best. I'm also, I'm also putting a lot of motivational strategy into this um, communique that I'm writing. In the motivational strategy here at the bottom, sorry, I moved that without thinking. Motivational strategy at the bottom um, is the, is the one where you've got um, you've got some kind of product, some kind of solution, some kind of whatever, and you're trying to show that this is the best thing for them. You're selling. This is a sales strategy, right? You're selling. And they actually give us little five components that we might um, that we might include in there. Um, we get our clients' attention. We create a need for the product. We tell them that we can satisfy that need. We help them to visualize it. Um, and then we uh, and then we get them to act. We get them to buy in, right? So motivational strategies are very common. Uh, depending on what kind of engineer you are, you may have people in your marketing department that do the motivational stuff, but engineers still are involved in that. And I'm definitely trying to sell my idea. So I am trying to provide motivation in my uh, communication that I'm doing with my fellow teachers. So um, these are these are the uh, the skills that we that we learn here at the beginning of chapter six. The skill of finding the research that we need and then beginning to organize that research, right? We want to organize the research into some kind of format that is going to get our point across, convince other people of what we're trying to do, um, sell something to them, uh, whatever it is we're trying to do. We're trying to organize it in some kind of effective format. That is going to involve a lot of the writing techniques that you use, that you've used before, that you've been taught. For example, outlining, rough drafts, rewriting. That's going to lead to those things. And that's kind of where we're going to get to in the next section, 6.2, which we will cover on Wednesday. So be prepared for Wednesday to come and do a little bit of writing. We will probably have a little bit of a writing quiz. And uh, you have the homework. I would get started. Like I said, there's lots of parts to the homework in six, chapter 6. And we will see you guys on Wednesday.